Okay, we're working on this uh, this business of the dry friction. And uh, trying to do a better and bigger job of it than we did with the, uh, with the in physics one, because you're brighter folks now, so you can handle it. So imagine some crate sitting on an inclined plane such that the plane is at an angle which is less than phi s. Remember what that is? The angle of static friction. Yeah, that's the angle of static friction. is equal to the coefficient of static friction. That's just because, uh, well, the way we're more familiar with seeing the coefficient of friction is that the friction force equals the uh, coefficient times the normal force. And so if we spin that around a little bit, we get that definition of the angle of of static friction, but it's actually a, a physical angle. It's not just something we're idly making up. If we look at a free body diagram of the object, make it a little bigger, make this one, these next couple drawings kind of big. We got a lot of stuff to get in there. So don't be don't be skimpy. And of course we've got the weight there. And since it's uh, tilted up a little bit, it's tending to slide down the plane. So there's going to be some friction force up. And there'll be some normal force that is uh, helping cause the friction. In fact, that's, that's essentially the force keeping the two surfaces together. And the magnitude of that force determines just uh, is part of what determines just how big that force, the friction force, will be. What's the fact that we're at an angle less than the static friction angle mean? It, it's not. It yeah. It means that it won't spontaneously slide down the slope itself. It also means a little bit more than that as well. Because what we'll do, what we'll, if we're less than that, what we'll look at next is the situation where we're at the same angle. What's different between the two in terms of what's going on with the friction force itself. You're not quite sure if it's in static equilibrium. No, here, it's in static equilibrium in both places. It's not going to slide down here, and it's not going to slide down in this case either. But what's the difference between the two now that we're at the static friction angle with the slope? Well, let's see. Let's, let's investigate it a little bit more and see if we can come up with what the deal is. So uh, remember that had to do with this with this resultant. And that's the angle between the resultant and the normal. In these, these um, situations, it's very much the case where R is indeed vertical. In fact, that's part of what uh, is required for the static equilibrium itself. So what happens when we get to this angle? Notice that this is itself the static friction angle. In this case, not sub s, 
because uh, we're just at some angle less than theta at uh, phi s, because that's a particular angle. So it's true that theta equals phi, but happens to be less than theta and phi s. What happens when this angle is phi s? In that case, we can draw the free body diagram for that one as well. So we're at a, a little bit bigger angle. Still have the same weight. We have a normal force. It's not the same normal force because that normal force is a function of the angle as well. What's going on when that angle is itself phi s, the static friction angle? That's a particular point. It's a point of of uh, of particular importance. Yep. At, at that point, if will the box let go? Basically, if normal force is more than zero. Well, the normal force is always more than zero. I mean, is that the point? Uh, not quite. Remember, this is the static friction limit. it's at the point of impending motion and the friction force is the maximum. In either case, R equals W. drawing that the weight and the um, and the resultant pass through each other which we get because we know that the the action of those two is a, is a bit off the center point that uh, eliminates any possibility that the moments wouldn't be balanced. If W equals R and they pass right possibility. Okay. Tilt up uh, a plane 
with uh, the two surfaces of interest in contact. When it starts to slide, you know you've just passed the static limit and you can then find the coefficient of static friction without even having to know the, you don't even know, need to know the weight of the object or the normal force. You can just do it from the angle. The next possibility, of course, is we go a little bit beyond that. To a point theta greater than phi sub s. Now what's the situation? Yeah, now the box starts to slide. And so we have a normal force. It's starting to slide now. We have kinetic friction. Notice that this is essentially a constant. Remember, the kinetic friction does not grow, essentially, uh, does not grow very much uh, as the sliding continues, no matter what the, the speed or the force pulling it down. So this angle will be constant. Any tilting beyond that will cause the normal force to not be vertical anymore. Oh, sorry, the resultant force to not be vertical. And uh, then you have other balance problems you have to worry about. That coefficient of kinetic friction is actually supposed to be the arc tangent, right? That no, you take the tangent of an angle. Okay. Now we can add to this the minor complication. And again, keep your free body diagrams kind of big because we've got lots of stuff to get in. We'll start at an angle again, sort of shallow. We're at less than the static friction angle. And this time we'll add some kind of force against that. We want to find P, find whatever that P is for. Impending motion, now that we're at an angle where we're just less than the angle of impending motion anyway. Bigger free body diagram. We 
we've got our weight and our applied force. Find P for impending motion. Now, we're assuming the P that's big enough to get it to start moving up the plane rather than a P that's small enough just to keep it from moving down the plane. So what's the rest of the free body diagram look like?
So we need the sum of the forces in the y direction to find out what n is. You got about three seconds to do that. N equals Yeah, we only have the, the y component of the weight, which is w cosine theta. So we can put that in that piece up here. Mu s w cosine theta plus w sine theta. And presumably, then, all of those things are known. And we can even put in the angle then if you want. Pull out W. No, it wouldn't be easier just to leave it out. I mean, leave it as was. And since presumably the weight, the coefficient of friction, and the angle are known, then we can find out what P equals from that. Okay, got it? And we can do then the next part of the problem where we push it down instead. So you set that up. Find P for impending motion. Since we're at an angle less than the static ang friction angle, it's on its own below impending motion. So what P would cause it to just start to move? just get to the point of impending motion. If we were at the static friction angle of the incline, then that P would be zero, because we're already there. We're already at the point of impending motion. So, just do the same thing we just did with the up force, just do it for the down force. to move down the slope. So static friction is going to be up. We want to be just at the point of impending motion. So we know we're at the maximum static friction. Actually, the maximum of either friction.
time, man. No, I won't be strong. I'll just throw arrows here and there. <laughs> Especially when you put the arrow in the wrong direction. Just catch it. Oh, yeah. Because that's the only way that the forces are all going to add up to zero. Since this is a limit, this this number, how big P is, if we're at the static limit, that's set. And so P gets big enough, then we need to oppose it with something else up the slope. And the only possibility is that R tilts over like that.
in so we can then solve for P. Mu S N ends now W cosine theta. No, N is N is W cosine theta. Right? Yeah, minus W sine theta, you got it. Yeah, minus W sine theta. And then you can take out the mu s, if you can write one, and put in the tangent of the angle. All right, let's put a little bit of this stuff to work here. Everybody get something like that? Not very much different from what we just did. Okay. We have a box connected by a cable connected to a counterweight. W1, this is W2. Coefficient of friction between those two, we'll say, is 0.25. And we'll make the slope 45 degrees. The most common slope in nature. That's why we use it so much. All right, find the range for W one. There's a minimum W, and W2 will start to slide down the slope. There's a maximum W, W2 will start to slide up the slope. So you want to find the range for those between which W2 will stay. Everybody? Everybody. My sisters and their husbands and their kids and 
my parents. So you wouldn't even notice we were there. We could sneak in easy. <laughs> I, I would have to find some extra chairs, though. Oh, I got a chair. We got extra chairs over here. <laughs> <laughs> we can bring, see, we not only bring our own chair, we bring our own table. You have to do two calculations, one where you're keeping it from sliding down and one when you're keeping it from sliding up. You know, assume it's right at the point of impending motion because you're trying to find the limit on these. You do whichever one you want first. But you do have to do it twice because one time it's about to slide up, one time it's about to slide down. So far. Maximum 
W1. That's the point where it's just about to slide up the slope. So we can do a free body diagram then on W2. Assume that the pulley is frictionless itself. We may not be able to get a high over four bag of sand, but we can get a frictionless pulley tomorrow. And if it's just about to slide up, then we know that the friction force is down and we're looking at the impending limit, so it's right at its right as it's about to uh, about to slide up. So friction force is opposing that. Maybe we should make it a get out of class question. Nobody said yes, please do. So I didn't say it was, I just said it could be. We canceled it out. Okay, do do the next problem. What is it? I don't have it up there yet. I think we're up I'm not ready. I can give you a problem to work on over the break so that you don't forget me. Would you like to come back with a little gravy on it? See, if you didn't sit over there all alone, Alan, you could help her. See which one's easiest to work with. We'll both go into Ace Hardware. Pie. It's a good pie over two or a bag of sand. No, they're pie over four bag. They got they pile over square root of two or eight, eight, eight or something. I wasn't so one of those in so long. See the faces. See the face that makes them. Square root of two will reduce to. Square root of 2 over 8 reduced to more square root of 2 anyway. What's that? It doesn't matter, it's still a stupid eight. fraction. Huh? You say square root of 2 over square root of 8. Yeah, that's what they have. Where? Yeah, I don't know. How do you even get that? Huh? How do you even get that? Oh no, it's got square root of 2 over 2. I guess that's a 2. For 2. More like on a pigtail. <laughs> Have to pick X and Y somewhere. Doesn't really matter where. Just makes it a little bit easier one way or the other. So we know W1 equals F max, because we're right at the point of impending friction, plus W2 sine 45. Right? And why somebody sees sine 45 and says, oh, goody. 
Let me put in, what is it? Pi over 4 or something stupid? Square root 2 over 2. Why 0. 0.71 doesn't work just as well? I don't know. And f max, we know to be mu s n. We have mu s, but we don't have n. Maybe I could do that in a fraction. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean a real fraction, a fraction that makes it useless. Square root of one over square root of sixteen. Something. That we're getting more useless, but we need it. We need it to be more useless. I don't know. You guys, you guys are happy with that, not me. Oh, this is W2. And so you can put that in the top part, put in the numbers. Coefficient of friction is 0 0.2. The normal force is W2 cosine 45 degrees plus then W2 sine 45 degrees. And that all reduces to, anybody else get it besides Alan? Alan, that's right so far? Mm -hmm. Didn't make any goofs? That reduces to a god-awful fraction if we're lucky, a simple decimal if we want to actually get some work done. Even Alex Trebek isn't that harsh. 
if you went, you went six, seven decimal places, it'd still be just crossed right out. I know, they call them, they, they like the exact answer. Where we live in the real world, where nothing's exact. Except, I don't know, counting, that's exact. If I got a dozen eggs, I'd have 12 eggs exact. I don't know. But if you could double the yolk, you're... You can only see so small on your measuring stick. Huh? You can only see so small on a meter stick. It's not in the world. They don't actually use a meter stick. Can't imagine what it's like when they build a house. They they never get off the ground. See, that's why they go into things like becoming actuarials. That's all they math and they do. They, all they do is count the people who are died, dead and who aren't dead. <laughs> math majors teach math. Yeah. I told you that, that one time I was at an engineering conference, the National Engineering Academy in Washington, D.C. Yeah, they're all bitching about it. Yeah. Is anything being actually done about it, though? No, it's, it's way too political. Can you imagine going back to school and saying, we're not going to let the math teacher teach our math anymore? In a huge uproar. Because you don't understand, you don't know what we do in meetings. We argue about stuff. We fight over turf. And the less turf there is, the harder we fight. I'm sure. All you got to do is say, oh, Newton. time to go. Newton was an engineer, and he invented calculus. <laughs> They think, was, uh, they think it was a mathematician, a royal mathematician. Yeah. So if F max is on the other side, that's the only thing that changes, and for the minimum, the minimum W1 is 53%. So, I don't see again how a good Thanksgiving break. I mean, if I don't see you again today, I'll see you again, I hope. Right, Bill? You're coming back, aren't you?